Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Surface Ventures webinar. It's good to see people already saying hello in the chat. That's great. Um, before I sort of dive into everything, uh, I'd just like to uh, to invite my uh, my co-presenter on stage. So, Mark, if you could just uh, you'd come on stage, please, and we'll just say hi to... Uh... So, there we go. I'm just loading in. Excellent. Good to see all of you saying hello there. Fantastic. Good morning, everyone. Well, Mark, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, please. Ah, okay. So, good morning. So, uh, my name is Mark Hervé. <laughs> I'm relieving the pain of Sam to pronounce my name. Uh, <laughs> so, working for the company Early Compadizers. Thank you very much for the invitation to present, to co-present with you uh, uh, for the end. And uh, after your very good technical presentation, um, I will go over um, what Early Compadizers solution are and uh, present a couple of uh, applications. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. All right, so um, for now, what we'll, uh, what we'll do is I'll bring my uh, bring my slides up. We'll go ahead and uh, let's let's, uh, let's kick off some, of course, today's presentation on PVD and CVD coding technologies. All right, so an overview. So I'll try and put, you know, provide an overview of both PVD and CVD. Please be aware that both of these are extremely technical coding methods and um there will be points where i'm going to have to sort of speed through some of the slides uh, of course the replay will be made available to you um as with all of these so you know please do feel free to you know to go back you know pause on slides and look at some of the information i'll try and i'll try and go through things as quickly as possible i'll discuss a little bit of the advantages and disadvantages of each technique and the sort of subtypes of each technique as well and just take a few slides as well towards the end to to talk about the different uh, coding families that can be applied and sort of uh, a bit about coding selection methodologies um so before we begin i'd just like to just put a quick poll question out asking how familiar you are with pvd and cvd while i move on to the next slide so i've shared this in previous um in previous webinars that being you know different surface engineering methods whether that be modifying the surface changing the composition or leaving it unchanged versus applying a coating generally there's three types of this electrolytic fusion or vapor phase today we're focused on vapor phase with both pvd and cvd Okay, fantastic to see so many people answering the poll question. If you haven't done that, could you could you please please do so? Um, okay, so somewhat experienced, very experienced, not at all. Okay, uh, one thing as well, um, as this is a workshop session, please do feel free to you know at any time type your questions in the uh, questions in the box. If it's something short, I'll try and answer it then. If not, I will mark it and then at each of our Q&A sessions, we can, we can try and answer that. Okay, so beginning with PVD. So this is a vacuum process. So essentially we try, we, um, this occurs in vacuum. We take one phase, uh, one phase of material, convert it to vapor, and then move that from the target onto the substrate we want to coat. This is atomistic deposition. So we vaporize this from solid or liquid and then transport that um, either through vacuum or low pressure uh, or gaseous environment to the substrate where it condenses. So essentially you're settling atom by atom, building up a coating. So we can do this by either the same source material to the one we want to deposit. So generally things like, um, you know, if we take magnetron sputtering, we're going to have a, a target. I'll talk more about that a little later, but we take a, a solid target um, and then we're moving things from solid onto, you know, through vapor then to there. Or we have a reactive gas, in which case we can make, um, we can make, uh, you know, nitrides, oxides and other things. Yeah, moving on. So the three fundamental steps of this. So the actual vapor phase generation from whatever the material stock would be, either solid or liquid. Transfer of the vapor phase, that is trans transporting the material that is being settled onto the, you know, onto the substrate, the, the coating material there. And then the actual deposition and condensation and film growth. So these... Um, 
you can think these, these are each, you know, each separate steps, but, you know, we can, the various different methodologies accomplish these in different ways. So some of them can be, as it says, we say here, superimposed on one another. And, um, you know, and of course, this is going to produce, a, you know, a uh, essentially a composite of a substrate and coated material. Um, but, you know, this is, you know, these are complex things to study. You know, the, the um, interactions of this are, you know, partly dependent upon the substrate material in terms of load support, you know, how hard is the coating, how thick is the coating, you know, all of the sort of things you would, you would see discussed in, you know, the many surface engineering papers in the many surface engineering journals. Um, so typically the thickness of this would be a few nanometers up to 10 micrometers, typically. Um, you know, we can actually, you know, we can coat very small to very large things. So this is all chamber size dependent um, because, you know, if you're coating, say, a very large pane of glass, you need to be able to fit that very large pane of glass into your vacuum chamber. This would, of course, increase the cost of said procedure, but, you know, that's, that's entirely doable. Uh, one thing to be aware of specifically with PVD is that it is line of sight. So complex geometries, you know, if you have something you want to coat the back of it, you're not going to be able to do that because essentially if you have your coating source and you are moving things there, it's not going to move around the back of that. You are just moving material in one direction. So that is one thing, you know, to be aware of. And this can be mitigated somewhat with, you know, arrangement of, um, of uh, mounting hardware within the chamber. So as something, um, you know, one consideration to be made, depending on, you know, whatever it is that you want to coat. Um, deposition rates can vary from 10 to 100 angstroms uh, per second, and with typical process temperatures being 200 to 300 degrees, but you can go, you can go lower than that. Um, typically, when you're going higher, you're then into the realms of uh, CVD or plasma assisted CVD, but, you know, we'll cover that a little bit later. In terms of history, um, there have been quite a few advances in this, with the most recent being high PIMS technology, high power impulse magnetron sputtering. Um, and of course, the you know the actual patents and number of, of if you look at total number of, of publications um, with this per year, this will have shot up. There is still a lot of uh, you know, still a lot of work to be done. In terms of you know of high PIMS, you know quite often you'll see um, you know conferences and seminars dedicated just to high PIMS technology as well as you know some of the other um, coating uh, technologies. We could take this uh, take this opportunity now to um, to ask another poll question just about your you know, current position, whether you're an undergraduate, master's student, PhD, tenured academic, or industry professional. So. Uh, thank you all for those that have answered the first poll question. If you haven't, please go ahead and, and do that. Um, we'll move on. So uh, historically, PVD processes are relatively expensive just because of the relatively slow deposition rates when compared to um, other coating techniques, things like, um, you know, if we compare that to things like electroplating, electroplating generally has a far higher deposition rate, but, you know, the methodology is, is quite different. Um, we have expensive vacuum equipment to deal with, and there are, of course, throughput limitations because you can only load so many pieces into your vacuum chamber, coat them, and unload them. So this is, uh, again, this sort of comes back to, you know, vacuum equipment. The better the pump setup, the better your vacuum chamber, the more throughput you can have, you know, but as well, um, operators for, you know, for these types of equipment need to be very skilled in order to make sure that they're running their processes properly. Uh, but, you know, in more recent years, um, you know, this is, this is growing, you know, reduced costs and a greater demand for high performance materials and coatings. So typically, you know, we want these, these composite materials consisted of you know, of, of well-chosen substrates along with, you know, a, a coating that suits the, uh, uh, that suits, you know, whatever um, environment that it is going to be, uh, going to be applied in. In terms of 
basic technologies, there are two ways we can convert something from either solid or liquid. Uh, well, evaporation from liquid to vapor, and then sputtering from um, from solid to vapor. And that's essentially the, the two ways that we that we convert um, that we convert our uh, material to be coated into the coating. So those same as before, using those three fundamental steps. Um, and then, you know, the sort of assembly of this material onto the surface is, you know, is slightly different. Um, you know, Brookwine, there's e specific equipment for each one of these, um, for each, each of these techniques and the subtypes applied to them. Uh, thermal evaporation. So essentially, you know, these are our first type. So essentially we have our, um, you know, our vessel, um, typically, you know, you have inductively heated crucible so you'd use induction heating excuse me um with some kind of molten uh molten liquid we have that to high temperature uh we'd heat the um we'd heat um the material up to its melting point tm uh the substrate is placed above the crucible and then we can you know open the shutter um and then essentially just evaporate these, uh, the pure metal, the pure molten metal, as it deposits and condenses onto the substrate. Um, once again, because this is line of sight, you're not going to get equidistant, um, uh, you know, equidistant um, evaporation and condensation at the same rate with this. It's going to be greatest, obviously, directly above that with it decreasing around if we look at that, that diagram there, um, you know, and, you know, for better, um, uh, for better uniformity, planetary sample holders um, are used. And this is, and these are used in other coating techniques as well. This isn't a thermal evaporation um, specific thing um and then deposition rate typically you would use that you would monitor that with quartz crystal and again that can be applied in other uh coating technologies other vacuum coating technologies as well okay so moving on arc evaporation so instead of uh instead of inductively heating that we can use a high current low voltage arc to vaporize uh the electrode well whether that be uh, cathodic or anodic and deposit uh, the material onto the substrate. We have a very high rate of ionization with this and we can bias this in order to accelerate uh, the ions to the surface. So typically this will produce a, a more dense coating if you have a bias voltage applied. One of the problems with this is because of the, the arcing is a little less controlled so you can have much larger what we call macromolecules or droplets so you'll typically end up with a rougher uh a, a rougher coating for this but this is excellent for nanocomposite coatings because of this arcing we can if it is very well controlled you can reduce the number of macromolecules and then you can get nanocomposites of of various different types of of uh ceramic nitrides as 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 we have as we have there and then we can of course these are extremely hard films you know as most as most ceramic nitrides are um so in terms of those are our two two sort of main evaporation processes um you know these are relatively simple and relatively inexpensive as far as vacuum coating procedures go the substrates are effectively unheated but of course, we have the, the radiation from the evaporation source, so you can be a little bit less conscious about the thermal properties of what you are coating, and you can coat very high purity films with this. But alloys are extremely difficult to coat just because of the different melting points. You need to you, know, you need to know very well what um, what what the alloy is and what its uh, what its liquidus point is, liquidus points of each of the constituent parts of that again line of sight so you'd need sample rotation in order to to coat everything that you want to um if you want to deposit refractory met metals you know anything super hard like you know like tungsten um you know as an example very high temperatures are required because you need 
to melt it in order to, you know, we're moving from, from liquid. Um, and then of course, surface finish, as I mentioned, because of the droplet condensation. Uh, sputtering, so this is um, you know, non-thermal vaporization um, where we're ejecting ions uh, or surface atoms that are ionized from the surface towards the substrate. Um, so with this, you would normally bombard it with an ionized gas, such as argon. So there's a specific flux of that onto the, uh, you know, onto the surface. Um, there's control applied by magnetic field, and then we can direct uh, we can direct that those uh, the flux of coated material onto the substrate. Basic steps: for plasma generation. We form a glow discharge plasma. You can look at uh, different plasma regimes, but essentially we want a nice stable glow discharge. Um, where you know we're using our electric field to ionize that, and then um, you know we have our argon um, bombarding the surface with high energy, transfer their momentum to the target material, which um, essentially you are releasing you know single atoms you know at a time, um, ejecting those from the surface of your of your solid material, and these then head towards um, head towards the material to be coated. Um, you know, it's not to say that they're just going to move directly there. This is, you know, there are multiple you know, collisions and everything. So this is, uh, you know, this is once again, complex. Distance and geometry um, are very important to take into consideration here. And like with the evaporation, we get, you know, atomistic uh, growth. So, you know, this will settle. Um, the actual morphology of these techniques. Um, one thing I just I haven't covered it in this just because there's there's enough on the technologies, but um, uh, yeah, there's um, phase diagram. Not phase diagrams. Apologies. Um, um, good author like Andre Anders with the um, uh, different morphologies of uh, coatings applied, depending on what the energy of the particles are, depending on what the temperature is. Uh, structure zone diagram, sorry. Um, so structure zone diagrams, I would recommend would be a good thing for you to look up in terms of um, these. So moving on. So here we have another more detailed picture. So this is um, PVD applying onto a synthetic uh, material. So you can sort of see, um, where our magnetic field controls where um, our argon is impacting the surface um, and then where that is removing material and you know, where that is then heading towards, um, you know, the plasma flux is then heading towards um, whatever the substrate is and then settling on the surface. So uh, this is a slide I'm not going to spend too much time on, but you can sort of see um, with this there's, um, you know, various different uh various differences between these once again i would recommend you know look back at this in the replay arc versus magnetron generally uh magnetron has a lower deposition rate um but a smoother film quality it has a lower rate of ionization versus the arc where you know we know that we're you know we're taking it up to a very high ionization rate um good adhesion with arc generally lower uh, with magnetron, just because the energies are are uh, are different, uh, arc requires conductive materials. Magnetron, you can you can deposit onto non-conductive substrates, um, so long as your chamber is set up uh, to do that. Uh, magnetron has much more difficult process control, just because there's far more things you can you can vary in terms of uh, you know temperature, um, electric field, you know this. A, a ton of different things, and this is where this is where very good process engineers and coating optimization comes into play. And now we come on to high PEMS, high power impulse magnetron sputtering. I'll just mark that question. Uh, so I'll come to that one later, Naveen. Just seeing your question there. Uh, hello there for people that are that are just joining. So in terms of arc, of course, as we've mentioned, that has droplets, but it has very good high ionization. 
uh, Magnetron, the ionization is lower, no droplets. So we can try and combine these by having a much higher powered process in high PIMS. So based upon Magnetron sputtering, it uses extremely high power densities in pulses in order to control the deposition. Whereas Magnetron typically is just, uh, you know, it's continuous power. Um, whereas you can have these pulses in order to control the movement of uh, your plasma flux. So you can bring it towards the surface, bring it back. Um, this requires expensive and sophisticated power supplies. Um, you know, we can do a lot with this. You can have inhesion enhancing pretreatments or, you know, sort of uh, interlayers deposited by this etching of substrates because of the high energies. Um, depositing, what's that? Droplets created by ARC are only impacting the final roughness. ARC coatings actually have a uh, very good adhesion. Thanks, Mark, for um for that uh so um generally with high pims uh very thin films um dense columnar structure with no voids once again uh structure zone diagrams uh take a look at that and you can sort of look at you know the region where where um high pims um films come into play and with these you typically get you know chromium nitride niobium nitride different optical films uh, such as silver um you know, some microelectronics films if you want extremely thin uh, copper, titanium nitride, titanium, um, and then, you know, other various hard coatings. In terms of selection material, um, as I've sort of covered uh, talking about this, you need to be aware of, you know, the type of material that you're depositing, you know, what rate of deposition do you need? Like, do you need a, do you need a very thick coating applied quickly? Um, substrate limitations, um, deposition temperature, of course, dependent upon, uh, of course, dependent upon, um, you know, what technique you're using, size and shape of your samples as well, uh, how well adhered the coating needs to be, what is the throwing power, ability to, to produce, you know, good uniformity across irregularly shaped objects, uh, how pure do you need your materials? Um, of course, you can achieve this with, you know, we said with uh, with evaporation techniques, you can generally apply very pure materials. That's true. You can also do that with magnetron, uh, but of course, you need extremely pure uh, target materials, which drives the cost up a little bit. Equipment requirements and their availability, cost, and of course, ecological considerations in terms of um, you know, uh, removal of any you know waste gases, waste materials. An abundance of deposition material. One thing to note, of course, is that, you know, I said earlier that um, electroplating is great for applying very thick coatings. While that is true, uh, waste disposal with that, because generally you're going to have very large tanks of electrolyte uh, that need to be disposed. So generally, in terms of environmental concerns, PVD is probably still, you know, it's probably still much, much better. Uh, substrates. So PVD processes are compatible with most metals and you know, and some plastics, um, of course, with this, you know, your polymers have to have a very, uh, you know, or at least a reasonably high glass transition temperature. You can deposit things under lower glass transition temperatures, but you might need to do it in stages so that your chamber heating, your chamber doesn't heat up too much. Um, if you're deposited, depositing without heating, you are still going to heat the substrate because you are bombarding ions onto the surface. And that can still be enough to deform your polymer. So that is something you should be aware of. Um, you know, you should sort of think about, uh, you know, the easiest things to coat are those that are electrically, electrically conductive and remain stable at elevated temperatures. You don't want to be dealing with, you know, getting very, very close to the melting point of any, uh, of any material. Um, you know, when you go from, from metal to glass substrates, the number of process constraints become, you know, that increases. Um, you know, once again, porous metals um, are very difficult to coat, um, you know, depending on the way that they've been prepared, because, you know, there will generally be things trapped in the pores, such as oils and contaminants, which is going to contaminate your coating. Uh, you need to make sure that, um, you know, 
both the material that you are coating and the targets themselves, you know, don't have any surface oxides. So part of that is, you know, you need to make sure that you take care to uh, protect, you know, your target materials uh, during different coating processes. And you should also take care to actually prepare the materials that you are coating to make sure that they're not oxidized. You know, you don't have any other films on the surface. Um, you know, and as well, you know, if you've braised any parts together, that's another contaminant in there. In terms of advantages, generally, uh, it is a lower deposition temperature, as I mentioned previously, shorter cycle times when compared to CBD. Uh, most coatings, uh, very good high temperature resistance, um, just because the materials that you are coating themselves have high melting points, so they will uh, re uh, they will remain on the surface up to a high temperature, which is very good for tooling. That it's more environmentally friendly than electroplating, as I previously discussed. And you can use multiple techniques at once, um, you know, or combinations of different techniques. That's not to say you can only have one thing. Uh, limitations, moderate throwing power. You know, you need the rotation there. Uh, line of sight makes angular components practically impossible. It has a relatively small loading capacity. So again, this sort of scales with your chamber size, but this increases cost. Um, very high vacuums require, um, you know, expensive vacuum equipment and experienced personnel in operating this vacuum equipment. Um, a lot of heat is produced by this. So a lot of the, uh, a lot of the coating techniques, excuse me, require uh, cooling and you know, there's very high capital costs. The equipment itself costs a lot. You know, the pure ma materials cost a lot. Um, but in terms of general applications, uh, tool coatings, the, you know, extremely hard ceramics, decorative coatings, various different things, you know, door hardware, watches, uh, spectacle frames, mobile phones, and various other tribological coatings. Uh, once again, generally you know, hardness for different, uh, you know, fuel injectors, piston rings, gears, bearings, etc. Moving on to chemical vapor deposition now, I'm just uh, conscious of time, so just uh, so trying to trying to keep to time. So this is uh, it's a lot to cover. So, but once again, if you have any any questions, please do um, you know please do put those in the chat, and we'll uh, we'll we'll get to those in the Q and A sessions. So chemical vapor deposition, this is instead of, you know, physically adhering something to the surface, uh, we are forming something by a chemical reaction in vapor phase. This is heat activated uh, generally, um, although there are other methods, um, you know, to supply the energy for said chemical reaction, which I will cover. Uh, once again, atomistic in nature, and there are a lot of things that you need to consider with this. CVD is, is, is far more complex than PVD in terms of its thermodynamics. You know, it's plasma physics, uh, the kinetics of the particles, fluid dynamics, and of course the chemistry, because you need to make sure that you understand the chemical reaction that is, that is, that is being undertaken in order to prepare your film. Sequence of events during CVD, generally, diffusion of your reactants, you know, into the actual chamber towards the reaction zone. The chemical reactions of the gas in order to produce a new reactive species and byproducts. Once again, as with most chemistry, there's not just one reaction taking place. There's normally multiple. You just ensure that you craft your process in order that it, you know, it favors the reaction that you want to occur. You need to transfer, you know, transport then your initial reactants, their products to the substrate surface, adsorption, of the reactants on to the substrate surface. The chemical reactions themselves will then take place. We have the desorption of any adsorbed species and diffusion of the reaction products away from the reaction zone, having formed, you know, or having started that um, coating process. Important things to take into consideration, as I said before. The thermodynamics, how, how feasible is this reaction? This is going to determine how, how quickly you can grow a coating, you know, what your equilibrium conditions are, your gas transport, you know, which is going to, you know, you need to consider this in terms of what the geometry of your substrate is. Uh, film growth kinetics, how clean your substrate is, because, you know, you want to ensure that what you are chemically reacting, you know, your film reacting between, 
you know, the substrate, you want to make sure that is, you know, as you have planned it. Make sure you have scrubbing systems in for any byproducts that require them. And the composition and construction of the reaction vessel, you want to ensure once again that the chemical reaction is only occurring where you want it to occur. A little note on absorption versus adsorption. So absorption itself is essentially, um, sorry, we'll go the other way around. We'll do that. Adsorption, physical or chemical binding to the surface of a material, whereas absorption is where they are taken into the media. So you have this, this great diagram of a uh, little man eating a pie, absorbing something, so taking it into himself, whereas adsorption, he's, uh, he's having pie thrown at him. <laughs> Um, yep, so as we said, adsorption um, is capable of being absorbed as it exists in the fluid, the absorbent, the material that has been absorbed, and then the adsorbent, the surface on which adsorption occurs. So just some terms to, uh, to, to be aware of for this. There are various different reaction types, so it's like, I'm not going to go into a great a huge amount of detail with these different reaction types, but in short, pyrolysis, reduction, oxidation, compound formation itself, disproportionation, and reversible transfer. Um, I do recommend a little bit of, um, you know, a couple of textbooks to go and take a look at a bit later with this. So that should, um, that should, excuse me, that should help with some of these uh, with various uh, different reaction types, but you know, again, there's not enough time in this one session to cover everything with this. Uh, various different types of coatings we have with this. You know, uh, generally a lot of um, a lot of CVD would occur onto you know things like uh, silicon, uh, germanium. Uh, you know, where we can grow. Um, you know, things can be you know single crystal, germanium, silicon. Um, you know, of course you can still, you can still produce, um, things like ceramic coatings onto steel. Um, but we have, you know, far more complex, uh, complex input reactants rather than our, our one material, you know, and a reactant gas with PVD. And as you notice, there are far higher, far higher, um, chemistries. And of course we can have epitaxial growth with this, you know, we can grow in specific orientations, Although polycrystalline and amorphous is possible as well, depending on what it is you're actually growing. Um, in terms of classifications, you know, there's there's a lot of different types here: normal pressure, low pressure, electron-assisted, laser-assisted, hot filament, chemical vapor infiltration. In terms of plasma assistance, um, there's direct current plasma, pulse plasma, alternating current, radio frequency, and microwave. So microwave is, um, in terms of, uh, if you want to coat, coating polymers is actually very achievable by microwave, especially if you want to put, say, a carbon film onto a polymer. Uh, microwave is excellent for that because, once again, you can run, you know, you can, it's very easy to run for, you know, specific cycle times with this and then uh, move on to, uh, you know, just be aware of the temperature. Of course, this is going to require, you know, some temperature monitoring during the process, but you know, there's a, a little interesting, a little interesting bit there. Uh, things to be aware of once again, uh, that we've covered a lot of these already gas transport, film growth, kinetics, cleanliness, all of that in terms of the different processes. So atmospheric pressure, we have high deposition rates. It is relatively simple and you can get quite high throughput. However, it has pure, uh, poor uniformity and the purity is less than low pressure. And you can do this for, it's very easy to do this for thick oxides. So you just want to grow a really thick oxide coating just to atmospheric pressure. Whereas if you do low pressure, you have excellent uniformity and purity. However, the deposition rate is lower. Um, you can do polysilicon deposition dielectrics and doped dielectric deposition. So a lot for sort of mic microelectronics industry there. Metal organic CBD, MOCBD, it's highly flexible. You can deposit semiconductors, metals, dielectrics. However, it is, because we're dealing with this organic compounds, it is highly toxic, very expensive to get those source materials. 
And because once again, you know, you were venting out any of the, you know, the byproducts, unreacted products, uh, the disposal costs are very high for this. Um, this is used a lot for optical technology and some metallization processes, so tungsten plugs and, and copper. And plasma enhanced CVD or sometimes called plasma assisted. Um, I use either term, um, you know, if I, if I switch those up, that's, you know, that's, that's why. Uh, plasma is used to force reactions that would not be possible at low temperature. Effectively, you're, you're giving extra energy from the, from the plasma in order to, uh, to, to, to make a reaction happen. So, um, you know, this is great because it lowers the temperature from something that, you know, that could be, um, you know, that could be in the several hundreds of degrees down to, you know, 200 to perhaps 500 degrees with that plasma assistance or plasma enhancement. Um, Plasma damage is possible, however, and but you can create dielectric coatings with this, so that's that's a good. It's generally used for for that, but you know, there's other things as well in terms of plasma enhancement. You can do um, you know different hydrocarbons um, to create different DLC coatings by plasma enhanced CBD. Uh, in terms of substrates, um, so once again, substrate preparation is key. Uh, beef, they have to be free of greases and various oils, um, surface preparation. So you generally, you know, ultrasonic clean them and vapor degrease them before you load them in uh, to your chamber. Uh, vapor honing to improve adhesion. And you have to make sure that during heat up, um, you don't then further oxidize the surface. You can do in situ scrubbing um, with reducing gases or very mild acids and the temperature of the substrate promotes the reaction. Um, so you should have, you want something that is, you know, that has relatively good um, thermal conductivity in order to make sure that the, unif the temperature is uniform across the surface. Otherwise the reaction that is occurring across the surface is not occurring uniformly. And this will affect the properties and structure of your film. Um, because of that, um, Substrate materials have to accept heat without deforming. You can have a, a very high variance in terms of deposition temperatures from 200 up to 2000 degrees Celsius, depending on you know, what it is you're actually coating. Um, sometimes you can do some compensation for that deformation. Um, getting that heating is relatively easy if your workpiece or your substrate is small um and obviously this becomes more difficult the, the larger more complex it is um you can do you can use rack or rotation here and of course this is you know this is not necessarily you know this is not a line of sight process you are going to coat more things however just be aware that you're only going to coat where your reaction products are able to travel so you might need to you know to think about um you know, some sort of uh, rotation movement, uh, some substrate, you know, tumbled, vibrated or fluidized, you know, in order to make sure that you have uniform deposition. Um, of course, this depends on the transport properties of the reactant species. You know, if you can, if your reactant species is relatively easy to move, you know, throughout the chamber in order to, you know, to have a, a reaction occur across all of the surfaces of whatever it is that you want to coat, Great, you know, there's there's less things to consider, but you know, on a coating by coating basis, this is something that you need to think about. Temperature and pressure. Um, once again, you know, this will dictate, you know, what your thickness, uniformity, and deposition rate um, of your coating procedure is. Uh, you know, if you want very uniformly thick coatings with a very refined grain structure. You know, you need to select your temperature properly. You know, if you want smaller, you know, smaller grains, typically you're going to go up to slightly higher temperatures. Um, you know, or you know, or lower temperatures depending on you know, it's it's dependent upon what it is you're coating. Again, think about your you know your uh, once again structure zone diagrams. You know, deposition rates going to vary with this. You know, as well as you know, what can your substrate handle? Um, yeah, as we said, fewer CBD reactions are available, uh, for use below 800 degrees. So, 
you know, the higher the temperature, the more, you know, the more, the more open you are to, to, to several different types of reaction. Um, you know, and, but of course you can use the plasma enhancement in order to try and lower this temperature, but there's only so much, uh, so much that can be lowered depending on, you know, if it's a, if, if it's a, if, if it's a thermodynamically unfavorable process, you need higher temperatures in order to get it to happen. So as we sort of touched on with this, you know, chemistry and reaction rate, the re you know, we have several different methods in order to, to put energy into the system in order to make chemistry happen effectively. So thermal activation, typically above, you know, our 800, 900 degrees, um, you know, but, you know, this can lo be lowered depending upon what your pre precursors are, you know, what, what chemicals go into this beforehand. Um, plasma activation, we can get to, you know, 300 to 500 degrees. Sometimes you can go a little, can go a little lower, um, and photon activation. So you can use ultraviolet radiation. Um, you know, microwave is also possible as well as we've, as we, as we've covered, uh, so precursors are the starter materials. So, uh, it could be various different things, metal, metal halides, different chlorides, bromides, iodides, uh, carbon aisles, the hydrides and different organo metallic compounds are used. And of course, with these, <clears throat> you need to be aware of what your handling requirements are um, for these, because a lot of these compounds can be quite dangerous. And the choice of your precursor, you know, you want to think about how stable is this at room temperature? Um, you want a clean reaction. So, you know, choose something that's, that's going to produce that. Um, you want it to be relatively volatile, you know, at the temperatures that you're planning to run this reaction at, you want it to be able to change phase because that's what you require for this. And that makes it easier for transport, you know, of your products to your reaction zone in order to you know, make your chemical reaction happen. Um, you want mass production with a high degree of purity. And ideally you want to craft this such that you are, that you have one reaction happening ideally it's it's almost you almost never just have one reaction happening in chemistry though but you want you want the reaction that creates the coating that you want to be the thermodynamically most state the most favorable one with the side reactions being less favorable um again this is quite complex but you know something to be aware of um when you're creating different carbides nitrides or borides the metal halide vapor is accompanied by an additional reactive species such as methane, nitrogen, or boron uh, trichloride for each one of those. And of course, you have you know, methane for, for carbides and so on. Um, <clears throat> so the reaction of the reactive species that lowers the free energy of the reaction so that you're going to form, um, you're going to form the ceramic in preference to the pure metal so it's again it's it's all governed by the energetics of these various reactions uh but this can be changed by you know the reactor pressure temperature and reactant composition and of course with things like um say for example titanium nitride you know all of this you know the reactor you know the pressure temperature um and you know the various flow rates of different gases that go into that is going to affect what you know, the color of your titanium nitride is from something that is almost gold to sort of a darker, you know, almost kind of orange color. So, you know, there's, there's that to think of as well in terms of deposition rates, you know, surface kinetics, um, you know, low temperatures and high diffusion rates in order to get a, a good deposition rate. And, you know, we have here in our, our heinous plot for silicon deposition using various precursors. So you can sort of see what the you know what the growth rate is depending on your temperature um you know depending upon you know what the uh what the precursor is and then with that you can kind of you know you can choose what's you know what is the best uh what is the best precursor to use for the specific temperature that you want to run at in order to get a reasonable growth rate and of course with this you know we there are you know multiple things in play here you know, at high temperatures, typically it's mass transport limited because you want to make sure that um, you want to make sure you're you're providing enough material to the surface because at high temperatures, you're typically going to have a, a higher rate of chemical reaction occurring. Whereas at low temperatures, it's surface reaction limited. You want to make sure that your reaction is 
thermodynamically favorable enough that that's going to keep occurring with you know your relative mass transport so these are all things that have to be in balance for you know for a well optimized cvd coding process in terms of deposition uniformity so we've sort of we talked about um you know different gas velocities and uh you know and various things so one thing you can, of course, geometry, you know, geometry is important, you know, in a way of, you know, if it is, if you are moving gases across the surface, if you have a constant gas velocity above, you know, of course, you're going to get a reaction occurring, you know, where the reactants first see the substrate material upon which they're doing that. And also the, you know, this is where the fluid dynamics of the gas flow you're going to be there, you're going to create a boundary layer and you're only going to create, you know, you're going to essentially just grow a film on the first first bit of it, on the first uh, sort of section of it that, it, that um, they contact effectively. Whereas if you tilt your substrate and have a decreasing gas velocity, you can create uniform deposition and have a very thin boundary layer so that this can occur quite uniformly across all of your substrate. As I mentioned before, uh, you know, epitaxial growth is possible. You can grow a crystal, you know, with a particular orientation on top of another crystal. So you have single crystal materials that mimic the crystal structure of any layers below it. This is good for single crystal semiconductors. You know, this is great for, uh, you know, for the electronics industry. Uh, this is quite complex though you need a very clean surface uh essentially you know this requires a clean room and you this requires very high temperatures in order to get perfect crystallinity in the orientation that you require in terms of various advantages um for this um the actual technology itself is quite uncomplicated and flexible and you can get very many different variations as we saw with that you can create a wide range of metals and ceramics you can almost coat any shape at any size um you know once again you know think about your reaction product transport uh you know but of course with that it is not restricted to line of sight deposition you can use you can use this to reduce coatings, or you can grow freestanding structures. Uh, you can create various different uh, you know other thin films. You can produce fibers, monoliths, foams, and powders. The deposition rate is relatively high owing to that you know generally higher temperature. Um, you can grow far thicker coatings, and in some cases up to centimeters thick. Other advantages as well: uh, extremely um, you know, extremely pure coatings are possible. You can control the thickness of morphology, once again, by the control of the processes used. Um, you know, you can deposit different alloys. Um, you can have infiltration of various fibers and foam structures. You can uh, coat powders. You can simultaneously coat multiple things. You can have multiple reactions occurring at once. And it doesn't always require high temperature and you can be, you know, you can use various different uh, process variations for this. Other advantages, you know, we have uh, quite homogeneous con uh, surface conformity as we see there with a, a layered CVD ceramic. You know, we have, you know, you've, you know very, you know, a, uh, quite non-uniform surface texture, but you know this is able to uh, is able to to cling to that, and you know as we see, this process has quite a good quite good throwing power as it was able to to level that, and then produce uh, a a coating that is far less rough than the substrate underneath, and you know with these more awkward geometries, you know, deep, deep recesses, holes, another difficult to coat 3D configurations you can coat by CVD. <clears throat> in terms of limitations, um, it cannot work for everything. It's not the universal coating um, panacea. You know, you need to, you need to know, I need to have a, a generally a well-optimized process. 
Uh, it requires higher temperatures generally to be quite versatile. However, the plasma enhancement or plasma assistance, uh, you can offset this somewhat. And your chemical precursors require a high vapor pressure. You know, and this is can be quite hazardous. And the precursors themselves can be somewhat toxic. The byproducts of the reactions themselves can also be toxic and corrosive and have to be neutralized. And you have to think about the transport of that. Um, coming on to thinking about these hazardous gases. Um, so in terms of the, so the presentation slides will not be, uh, will not be shared. However, uh, the replay of this video will be sent to you all after, um, after this, you will be able to go through any point of the video, pause it, take a look at the slides, but the slides themselves, um, will not be, uh, will not be shared. Um, we do have some, um, some documentation to share uh, from Balzers a little later. Um, but yeah, moving on. So, you know, we have things like, like ammonia, um, you know, phosphine, hydrogen, silane. These are, you know, um, these, are, you know, can be you know, corrosive, flammable, uh, pyrophoric, toxic, you know, and um, produce, you know, various bodily hazards. So that's one thing to, uh, that's one thing to be aware of. In terms of applications, semiconductor industry and metallurgical coatings, you know, so um, in terms of product function, electrical, optoelectrical, optical, mechanical, and chemical. And of course, as we'd said, you know, there are various different, um, different product forms, coatings themselves, powders, fibers, monoliths, and composites. Um, so again, some commercial, um, some uh, commercial examples, diffusion barriers, diamond-like carbon by PCBD, uh, titanium carbide, titanium nitride, uh, iridium um, for small rocket nozzles, optical coatings, uh, CBD boron fibers um, you know, for aerospace. Um, you know, we have uh, graphene as channel materials, you know, so you can build up various different uh, you can build up various different um, uh, various different structures with this. Um, you know, so you can do that. You know, independent of wafer size. So we have an example here of something: uh, graphene transistor formation process used by Fujitsu Laboratories. Titanium nitride. Um, so this uh, typically you know, very wear resistant, very hard. Um, Although you generally put this on, you know, substrates that aren't temperature sensitive or less temperature sensitive, like tool steels or cemented carbides. Uh, diamond and DLC, you know, you can create, you can use CVD to create um, diamond itself. Um, you know, that has various, um, various properties. It's extremely hard. Um, it's extremely strong. Uh, good thermal conductivity, thermal expansion coefficient. Um, compatible with that of Invar, if you want to, uh, you know, if you want to put your diamond right next to uh, a particular metal for whatever, uh, for whatever application you require. Um, electrical insulation, very good uh, chemical resistance, high radiation hardness, and so on. Um, so you can grow diamond itself uh, by CBD. You can either, you know, thin films or you know a, a thicker diamond coating. Um, you can also grow bulk, bulk diamonds, of course. Uh, properties and applications, you know, as we've covered. Again, I'll, I'll sort of weave this up for a few seconds so it's easier to find in the video. But again, this is good for you to, to, all, to all look through um, later with the replay. Uh, now coming on to coating selection um, quickly. So there's various different types of, of coatings as we've, um, you know, as we said, um, with these, you know, there are various different uh, families of these. We have, you know, laser and surface welded electroplatings. You know, typically you're going to have, you know, pure metals for this. Electroless coatings, you know, um, you know, different uh, different nickel compounds, thermal spray, creating different uh, different oxides, chemical vapor deposition, as we've, you know, as we've covered, nitrides, carbides, diamond, DLCs you know, another different, you know, epitaxial crystals, 
physical vapor deposition once again different carbides and nitrides you know and we can of course also make solid lubricant coatings um this very good paper by uh by uh alan matthews on coating mechanisms and selection so with this you know you should think about you know what is your application and design components what are its functional requirements surface requirements you know it as well other things non-functional requirements and economic requirements for that and then you know we can think about that in terms of what is required and then what is possible so process characteristics material characteristics you know and the specific processes and materials required for those you can use these in order to you know produce um, a range of different options and then use testing you know testing of whatever application it is that you know your coding is for in order to uh in order to then say okay this is what i'm going to choose and this is what i'm going to use um as i said as well uh a little bit of recommended further reading just because these these both of these coding processes are such um they're, they're such detailed processes and there's so much to consider for each uh very good handbooks for each one of those uh Metox's handbook on physical vapor deposition and pearson on chemical vapor deposition uh, both of these are, are relatively easy to find so there's a reference for both of those and now moving on towards uh q a which i'll try and get through in a, in a couple of minutes but one thing um we have our our next uh surface ventures presentation with dr carl delve um so i just like to quickly share that uh share that link so please go ahead and feel you know feel free to register for that and we'll sort of say any any questions on any of the technical elements of um of this presentation before I hand over to Mark and he can talk about uh, Balzer's specific applications. So I'll wait a, a couple of minutes if anyone has any questions. So I think uh, uh, Devine, your, um, your question was answered there. So with regards to um, droplets created by arc only impact the final roughness, um, but uh, arc coatings themselves are generally have quite good adhesion, so. So that one is, is answered. Um, any other questions from, from anyone before we move on to, uh, to Mark's presentation? Okay, didn't see anything. So we'll have another Q&A to, to pretty much focused on, is it possible to combine CVD and PVD within, uh, within one device? It is, it is um, typically, this would be the sort of thing where you would have uh, PVD and plasma assisted chemical vapor deposition, because generally for um, other CVD types, you're going to need a very specific um, vessel in order for that to happen. But you can have, say, a magnetron sputtering PVD source that, say for me, uh, I'll give you the example of the coatings that I, that, um, I produced during my PhD. Um, interlayers of chromium, um, produced by magnetron sputtering, tungsten carbide produced by magnetron sputtering, uh, then a gradient layer of tungsten carbide um, or a gradient layer of tungsten carbide and DLC. So that's where you can you can start um, adding, uh, specifically in this case, the precursor was acetylene into the chamber um, as essentially the transition towards plasma assistance in the process. And then you can have you know various different DLCs on on top of that, say you know silicon or um, you know or just typical hydrogenated amorphous. Um, okay, next uh, next question. I'll just mark these so I'm I'm aware of what we've got. Um, so, could you please comment on the thermal stability of CVD diamond films? Does graphitization occur? Um, yes. Yeah, so of course this is. Um, the CVD diamond you produce still has all the same, you know, the same properties as, you know, as diamond itself. Graphitization is still going to occur. So you're only going to really be able to use the diamond itself up to, I think it's, you know, I think it's up to about 400 degrees before it will start to graphitize um, in normal atmosphere. You know, if you, if you have this in, in high vacuum, you can probably push that a little more because 
you know, it's going to depend upon, you know, the oxidative breakdown of the, of the CVD diamond. Um, so yes, um, you know, still be aware of thermal, uh, thermal stability. Another question here, what coatings or deposition method would you recommend for hot work tool steels using elevated temperature forming processes, such as the press hardening of steels, uh, hot work tool steels used in those. Um, so in elevated temperature forming processes to my knowledge, although I might be, you know, a lot of the time there's not really, if this is for sort of machining in those, again, any of the ceramics are, 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 are good. I think a lot of the time for actual, um, for elevated, te you know, for elevated temperature forming processes, it's probably more, more economical uh, just to choose, you know, a very, you know, a, a steel that has, you know, relatively good um, high temperature uh, mechanical properties, and then you can replace the, um, you know, the pressing hardware as required, um, because, you know, this is going to add cost onto your procedure. If, if anyone else in the in the chat has any more, um, you know, has any other perspectives on this, please, uh, please go ahead. But, you know, probably if you are going to code it, some of the, it's in the extremely high temperature. Uh, oh, here we go. Something from, uh, oh, Ben, thank you. Uh, titanium alum, uh, aluminum silicon nitride coating has been used for forming because they have better high temperature properties. So that is, thank you very much, Ben. So there you go. Uh, PVD titanium aluminum silicon nitride. For those. Uh, I got a question here on, oops, sorry. Uh, that didn't quite pop up there, but it was, um, it prefers CVD or PVD for mild steel. It depends what kind of coating you want to apply. Um, mild steel itself, um, you would be able to apply both CVD or PVD coatings. So it depends on the type of coating on what type of properties you want to get. Um, so we have uh, another question here. What type of coated insert gives more tool life while machining super alloys like Inconel 718? Inconel 718, uh, as with all the Inconels, it's, you know, it's relatively, um, you know, it's, it's quite hard and, you know, it grows, a, it grows quite a, quite a thick oxide layer. So, you know, I would say, you know, pick a particularly hard, uh, particularly hard ceramic. Um, Again, I don't have a, a, a specific, it's very, it's quite difficult to get a, a very application specific answer like that, but, you know, um, machining of super alloys is very difficult because you're going to need someone quite, um, quite experienced in that process in terms of, you know, turning rates, feed rates and all that kind of thing. But, um, you know, a well-optimized um, ceramic coated bit will probably do you quite well. Um, and yeah, another answer for Mark there. I think on the uh, on the the hot pressing there, um, high temperature resistance up to nine hundred to a thousand degrees. Aluminium chromium nitride coatings can help, but you know again, answering these very application specific things, um, we typically you know a lot of information is needed. But um, I hope that was useful um, for those of you that ask questions. Um, Thank you, Mark. And thanks, Ben, for, um, you know, for the input there. That is fantastic. Um, right. What I'm going to do now is we'll, uh, we'll move on to uh, Mark's presentation. So I will swap over there. So invite him on stage. All right. Thank you very much, Dan. There you go. Thank you. I'll just mute myself so, while you go ahead. Sorry. No, thank you. And I will try also to answer, you know, a few of the questions. Uh, we got a couple of good examples that uh, we can cover. All right. So again, thank you very much, Sam, for the very highly technical presentation and introduction about, you know, PVD, CVD coating family. Uh, definitely a wide uh, topic. Uh, so just for me, blah, 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 just a few words about me. I've been working now for 22 years so maybe too long already uh, into the, the the coating industry and the seam film uh, but with a main focus on dlc coating so diamond like carbon coating uh, but you know i've covered multiple kind of application from industrial application to uh, motorsports and 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 uh, uh, you know highly uh, 
high loads application overall. Uh, in general, you know, what, what I used to talk now when we talk about PVD and all, uh, I really like to use the, th the term uh, thin film uh, just to make a difference compared to the thermospray coating that you can find, which are more really thick film. Um, and, and when you know when we mention thin film, it's literally because, as you mentioned, Sam, we are talking about 100 nanometers up to 10, 15 micrometer in, in, in the you know high thickness. And today, you know, when the customer come to us, uh, we get a couple of questions which are very uh, similar all the time: is I would like to reduce the friction, or I would like to reduce the wear or for automotive motorsports is, can I reduce the fuel consumption? Uh, increase the lifetime. And there is a big concern over the past years is about the replacement, for example, of hard chromium coating, you know, which are made with uh, electroplating uh, that basically generate chrome six, which is now into the, the rich compliance could be an issue. So, you know, the PVD, the thin thin vacuum coating are definitely a good answer uh, to this. So as you've seen earlier, um, the technology PVD, PA, CVD, CVD uh, is giving very specific properties to, to the coating. So very high hardness, uh, depending on the composition, you can have a very low friction coefficient. Uh, by increasing the hardness, you improve also the wear resistance. It is, uh, let's say, free, uh, clean coating because you know we don't actually generate any waste when we produce the coating um, and a benefit which is you know a, a side of the coating itself is that we can actually uh, give weight reduction not because the coating is going to change any property of the parts when we're going to code them but it's just that once you get used to the coating you can design and manufacture your parts slightly different. Uh, that will lead basically to a weight reduction and probably better performances. So I'm not going to go too much into, into the techniques, but uh, if we look to early balsers on the thin film side, uh, we have actually all the technologies that some you mentioned before. So uh, when we use the PVD, we can supply coating made with sputtering or arc, uh, and we use definitely also PHCVD. So these are, I would say, the key technologies that we use. Um, that leads basically to, I would say, three main families then of kind of coating. Uh, the very first one, uh, I would call it the, the carbon-based coating family. Um, here, we are really looking about tribological application where the customer wants to reduce the friction, reduce the wear. And in this case, uh, we will use coating such as a WCC coating or DLC. So giving really high hotness, uh, we can easily go up to uh, you know 35, uh, 40 or even higher now uh, uh, GPA in terms of the hotness. And in dry condition, uh, we can have you know friction coefficient around 0 0.1 depending on, on, on the surface quality and etc. Most of the time, the carbon-based coating are made with PACVD, um, or now if we go to you know TAC coating or such application, uh, could be done with the PVD arc. Uh, but we remain normally with low temperature uh, process for that. The other big family uh, that I would like to mention, which is also relating to some of the question from the audience, is I would say the nitride-based coating. Uh, Normally, we use this coating not really for tribological properties in terms of friction reduction, uh, but more when we are looking for a very high adhesion, very high hardness, a very good abrasive uh, resistance, and also a very good temperature resistance. Um, I saw in the, in the answer that coating like you know titanium, aluminum, silicium nitride coating uh, are, are, are well used now. Um, aluminum chromium nitride could be too. Um, and it's true that for many applications that Ehrlichan Bazers is covering, like into the cutting tools industry, uh, we use mainly nitride-based coating uh, 
because we can definitely increase the lifetime of the cutting tools by protecting the, the edge. Um, and material like Inconel, which are very sticky, very abrasive and very hard, uh, we know now how to improve the lifetime and the quality of the machining thanks to, to some of the coating. But most of this nitrate-based coating are made at a much higher temperature. Uh, most of the time, we're going to use the arc evaporation technology, and therefore, we will be more around 400 up to sometime even 500 degrees, uh, depending on the process and the part. So got to be careful about the, the, the base material of the, of the component that we're going to coat. And over the past years, uh, we've developed now, I would say, some kind of new generation of coatings, which are more oxide-based coating. Um, again, we are looking for completely different uh, property here. And one of the main one is how to create a, an oxide barrier to the surface and resist in very high temperature uh, for the application. With the oxide coating, we can definitely work higher than a thousand degrees uh, uh, without any uh, you know, change on the structure of the coating. So I'm not going to spend too much more time on it. You, you have already a lot of uh, overview. Now, what I would like to, to show you more uh, is some application that we do, uh, because what we can keep in mind with all the presentation that there is not one coating for all. Depending on the application, depending on the environment, uh, depending on the material, we will have to go and look for different coating, meaning also sometimes different technologies. So here is just a quick panel of, of application that we are covering. So motorsports, for example, uh, it's all about you know speed, wear, uh, uh, power, um, and we get a lot of parts in movement. So for example, here, the, the finger follower in contact with the camshaft, really high load, uh, a lot of friction, sometime a lack of lubrication, and coating like a DLC coating are combining a very good wear resistance and also a very low coefficient of friction. So here, uh, it's pure tribological uh, application, high load uh, and low friction. Um, on a completely different application, we're looking to the medical uh, industry. And in this case, we are talking about uh, you know, dental screw. Uh, the, the screw will be made out of titanium uh, that will be a highly compatible material for, for, uh, for, the, I would say for the body tissue. Uh, but here, we know that you know, titanium, some have, we can have some issue with seizure when we actually apply the torque to be sure that the screw will fit in. By applying the coating on the whole screw, uh, we will actually prevent the seizure, and we will be sure that after a few months, uh, the screw will not start moving, uh, you know, inside inside the uh, the base. So here, different application. We are more looking to reduce the freighting and the seizure uh, than really uh, the, the friction, for example. Still in the medical. Um, a lot of application are on the instrument. So here we can combine also uh, different targets. We can look about the color of the coating, for example, to give some classification to the different instruments. Uh, but here on this very specific case, uh, the idea was to reduce the sticking effect that the human tissue may have on the instrument. That will basically improve the quality of the surgery. Uh, but also help a lot for the cleaning afterwards, uh, you know, with the UV system and everything. So having the coating will protect the, the, the surface, either made of stainless steel or titanium. So again, different, different field. Um, so far, you, you heard a lot about, you know, the technical, very hard, low friction. Uh, but we do have a lot of, I would say, deco coating. Uh, even here is, for example, in this case, we are combining uh, two different properties. We are looking the visual aspect. Uh, so the loudspeaker grill here is made out of stainless steel. Uh, so we'll give a certain uh, look, color to the part, uh, but would also bring with the, the extra hardness, a scratch resistance uh, to, to, to the part. 
very often when we apply a thin film coating, it's not only for one properties. We try to, you know, combine uh, properties to have a, a different result. Uh, here, as you can see, and, and probably Sam also, we are a big fan of this kind of application, you know, electrical shaver. Uh, uh, here, you know, the whole idea was first again, give a visual aspect uh, to the product. So it could be gold, it could be blue, it could be other kind of color. Uh, but, you know, we need also to improve the, the, the wear resistance and the scratch uh, protection. And also when you clean your product, uh, you may use sometime whatever kind of, of uh, detergent or alcohol or even water sometime. Uh, so the coating is here also to protect the surface of the parts. Um, we talked a lot about, you know, the, the semicon industry during your, the, 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 the presentation. Uh, here is one application that we're covering a lot. Uh, again, nothing to do about the temperature. Uh, we are really looking how to reduce the, the wear and making a very good scratch resistance uh, to, to the surface when the silicon wafer, for example, is going to slide on top of the chuck to avoid, you know, having uh, any any uh, pollution into the process. Big development at the moment, um, you know, in, in the, the energy and especially into the, the turbine uh, industry, we are looking always at ways to improve the efficiency and the lifetime of this equipment. But when we look to the blades, it's very difficult to actually apply a thick film because then you will have to make a full remachining afterwards. So this is why in this case, the uh, uh, thin film coatings are very good solution. Um, and now with the experience, you know, we've been able to develop coating which are really focusing on erosion and hot corrosion uh, protection. So here, uh, still a blade, still a vein, but it could be a different technology here. In, in this case, we're still on the PVD side, but now we are applying coating like M. Crowley, which are usually more applied with a thermospray technology. Now we are capable to actually apply this kind of solution with a thin film and therefore going to very complex geometry without having to remachine afterwards. I mean, I can go on and, and on, but. Um, here, big industrial reducing the wear uh, and, and, and also, you know, uh, the fretting and all. Um, and here, it's a very nice example that we are developing over the past years is applying a DLC coating uh, with a filtered arc technology, a TAC coating on a ceramic. And here, the interest is to reduce the wear, the friction into, I would say, a very special environment as the lubricant most of the time is going to be water. And everybody know that water is definitely not the best lubricant uh, that we can use. So here, the, you know, the DLC is bringing all the benefits in terms of low friction and really hard surface to avoid any seizure uh, for, for the faucet. So many, many applications. It can go up even to the, you know, coffee machines. Uh, yeah, the coffee beans can actually be very abrasive. So applying in this case a titanium nitrate coating, for example, on the wheel uh, was improving the, the quality and improving the lifetime. So as you can see, and based on the initial presentation, uh, there is not one coating and one technology uh, uh, for all. Uh, hopefully, you know, companies like Ehrlich and Badgers today is covering uh, uh, most of the company. Uh, a coating can have multiple function. Uh, it could be decorative, it could be technical. Um, the coating now are really part of the design from scratch. Uh, so as you heard, uh, you cannot coat all geometries. So it's always very good to think about the coating from the very beginning of the design of the component. So it sounds very complex. Uh, uh, you can trust me, it is, in fact, uh, but obviously, you know, thanks to a presentation like this and, and company like, you know, Bowser's, uh, we are located worldwide. Uh, so in case you get questions, yeah, you can easily find, uh, you know, an Ehrlich and Bowser's representative somewhere 
And, uh, you know, on the videos anyway, you will get my, my contact details. So, uh, yeah, now I would say that uh, I'm open to any questions. If there is any questions. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, right. Let me just look through and see uh, what questions we got. Ah, so we have one here on how about the toxo toxicological aspects of the coatings for dental implants? <laughs> so the so again, there is you know different kind of implants, when, especially when we talk about dental. So in the case here, the one I've shown. Uh, it's never going to be in contact with actually human tissue. Uh, so we, we don't have any issue about uh, this kind of uh, uh, compatibility, I would say, biocompatibility. Uh, but we have done many tests, uh, both on the, let's say, the food industry and the medical industry with coating like uh, DLC, uh, WCC, titanium nitride, to actually prove that there is no, uh, 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 how can I say, reaction with human tissue. So uh, this is why today PVD coating are really growing very fast for the medical industry, actually, compared to, you know, old, I would say, chromium-based coating that we can get. Okay. Uh, so I have another question here from uh, BipWab, who said, in your slide, nitride is mentioned to provide a hardness of 14 to 25 gigapascals. I feel it is a bit low. Titanium aluminum nitride itself can provide a hardness above 35 gigapascals. Is there any reason that? And actually, yeah, and I fully agree with that. Actually, I think it's more a typo issue than <laughs> anything uh, because simply, you know, some nitride coating, we can actually go even higher. Uh, you know, we, ha we had some coating where we can go up to 40 GPA. Uh, but then again, the question sometimes is, do we need that much hardness? Uh, in some case, definitely. Uh, so thank you for mentioning it. I think I'm going to have to correct basically the slide. Uh, and I fully agree with you. 35 will make much more sense than 25. Okay. And uh, we have another one here. Um, oh, dear. All right. That didn't pop up for some reason. Uh, the question was, what sort of roughness of the substrate is required for carbide nitride and oxide-based coatings? Haha. <laughs> so... Uh, I would say that right now the, the the surface quality will depend a lot on the coating itself. Uh, for example, you know, if you go with a DLC coating, uh, we know that DLC coating got a lot of you know internal stresses, and most of the time we use them for tribological application. Uh, so we may look to roughness prior the coating below RA 0.1, for example. Um, in order to have the best adhesion, but also the best behavior afterwards. Um, if we look to, let's say, PVD coating with nitrite coating, we are much more flexible uh, in terms of the surface quality. Uh, but always keep in mind, if you start applying a very hard coating on the rough surface, you may actually transform your, your, your parts with something very abrasive. So it's all also, you know, case by case based on the application and the needs. Uh, but the lower the roughness, I would say, better will be the addition and the behavior, whatever the application. Another uh, seems to not be uh, not be popping up. So there's a question here. You mentioned anti-sticking effect of balanit A coating. Is it based on the hydrophobic properties of the coating? So here. I, I've shown the balanite A, uh, but you know, if we start talking about hydrophobic properties, uh, then basically I would say that some some DLC uh, coating would actually even be better. Uh, it, it's really you know linked to the uh, surface energy um, and and how easy we can actually uh, you know clean the parts or reduce the, the sticking effect. Uh, here in this case, that was also a request from the customer to have basically the gold color uh, also for the classification. Uh, but if we look purely to the sticking reduction, I would say that DLC carbon-based coating will be actually a better yeah. choice. And uh, doping as well is another thing that you can do with DLC to to further modify it. Yeah. Um, it's coming to my uh, fluorine doping specifically for surface energy energy modification is is a really that's that's a really big thing. So, um, yeah. fully with you. Yeah. Uh, 
so got another one here another application question for high temper ap applications what is the best coating uh oxide aluminium oxide or non-oxide <laughs> coating what are the best methods for the application of these and again it's always what do we call high Absolutely. temperature application you know if we talk about carbon-based coating, a carbon-based coating cannot stand higher than really mm. 400 degrees C, I would say. Uh, but, you know, if we look to, let's say, even most of the nitride coating, chromium nitride can resist up to 750 mm. degrees easily, 800 in some case. And then we can go easily higher than 1,000 degrees. Uh, aluminum oxide coating uh, can definitely go higher, uh, but that will basically link to the next questions uh, it all depends on the geometry and the application and what are we looking for? Uh, because, you know, when we talk about high high temperature, but is that, a, again, a, a friction issue or an abrasion issue or just that we want a thermal barrier at a certain point? So, again, yeah, case by case, uh, and, and it could have different solution for the same application. Yes. Uh, well, there we go. We have two questions here. <laughs> In terms of PACVD, um, do you use do Bowser's use microwave PAC? Microwave PACVD. And then quest. So we, we get different we get different technology uh, uh, for for to apply the PACVD. Uh, so uh, uh, we, we we do have we can have we can have also RF uh, uh, system and etc. So different different technology again depending on the coating we really want to have yeah and then silicone nitride coating for biological mm -hmm. application uh no at the moment no uh we will stick more to uh, again as, as sam mentioned uh dlc coating uh but definitely depending on the application we can play with some dopant elements mm -hmm. uh including silicon to basically change the property of the the top layer of the dlc Yep, another question uh, from BIPWeb. Um, is there any challenge with the adhesion of oxide coatings, generally oxide being brittle? So uh, mm -hmm. I agree with the oxide. Uh, the good thing with the PVD technology that uh, we still, you know, in a few micrometer uh, thick uh, coating. And uh, uh, again, yes, brittle, uh, especially if you're in application with high load and shocks. Uh, but today, most of the oxide coating that we are looking, uh, it's not a lot of, of, of shocks, uh, mainly friction or just, mm. you know, thermal uh, condition that we're looking to cover. No one here of what, what oxide you, I presume that's, you know, what, what, what if you were, if, if you were <laughs> a lot to of choose what case, oxide. Again, yeah. depending on what we're looking. So it could be aluminum, it could be chrome oxide. Uh, it, it really depends on, on the application uh, at the moment. And then a final one, is there any alternative to, and is there an alternative to uh, aluminum oxide? There is always an alternative to whatever the solution today. Uh, it's all depend if you're looking for aluminum oxide uh, made with a, a thermospray coating. Uh, we may have alternative in terms of the composition, uh, but the, you know a PVD coating will be always a thin coating uh, and, and may not replace fully uh, what a thermospray coating can bring. So uh, got to be careful with that. Yeah. So once again, that's uh, okay. We got one more question, and then I think we'll 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 uh, call it on the Q and A there. But yeah, just coming back to that, it's like always think about. And yes, I see the other question about the DLC coating deposit on on ceramic material. Of course, we do a lot of coating today on ceramic. Could be uh, uh, alumina, for example, pure ceramic, or it could be uh, silicon carbide. We do that a lot. Um, I mean, the example that I've shown for the uh, faucet application, it's uh, with a alumina uh, disc, uh, but we do also a lot of, uh, 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 how they call it, uh, silicon carbide disc or, you know, ring for pumps, for example, for, for energy or et cetera. So definitely possible to apply that. Okay, so I think with, uh, with that, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll say, that's it for the for the Q and A. I'll just move on to uh, my final slide. Um, as I, I shared the uh, the website links and link to the book, so please do, for those of you that, that clicked on that, please go ahead and and enjoy that. I just like to 
could not hear you, Sam, anymore. Uh, this microphone should be on. I think I'm. I think I'm still. Microphone's still on, so probably just a slight technical issue with the platform there. Um, but yeah, just moving on to our sort of final bit here. Just like to, uh, just like to sort of say for those of you, uh, please. Um, yeah. Sorry, Mark. Right. Just one, one second, everyone. Um, so yes, sorry. Uh, yes. Yeah, so please do go ahead and visit the surface ventures website. Um, you can find all of our previous, uh, previous talks, um, on there. Um, you soon we will be, uh, we'll be advertising our, uh, our new, um, uh, our newest webinar, um, on there. You can also please uh, sign up to our mailing list, um, you know, to get um, information on our latest events, as well as our newsletter, uh, Modern Surface. Um, and I'd also just like to thank um, to Mark and Balzers for their kind support for um, today's uh, today's session. So that's been it's been fantastic having him unfortunately we, we have a we have a sound issue so i'm just going to say yeah I'm just <laughs> and just going to say as well uh you know thank you all for joining and with that um Yes, we shall uh, hopefully see you in, uh, you know, see you in our, you know, future, uh, future webinars, um, you know, future workshops. And yes, hope you all have a good, uh, good rest of, uh, good rest of your day. Um, so. So just going to say bye, everyone. Thanks, Mark. If you can hear me, unfortunately. Oh, I'll just leave the just leave that open for a moment while we uh, do this one final question. <laughs> okay. Right. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye for now.